It was Saturday evening. The sun had just set over the horizon, creating the kind of twilight that makes you wonder whether you should turn on your headlights or not. Mark Evans didn't have to make that choice. He was just pulling into his garage on a quiet residential street in Sharpsburg. A moment later, a slender, dark-haired man emerged from a side door carrying a duffel bag, briefcase, and laptop computer. Years of experience allowed him to handle the three bulky items with ease. One couldn't travel as much as he had to without developing such skills. He unlocked and entered the side door of his house, but did not call out to his wife, Lisa, to inform her of his arrival. He already knew she was not home. Instead, he made his way into the living room with his briefcase and laptop, placing his garment bag at the foot of the stairs leading to the second floor of their modest but cozy home. Placing the two items on the couch, he removed his coat and carried it to the closet near the front door, where he hung it on the familiar coat rack. Only now that both hands were free and he was in the comfort of his own home, did he remove his jacket and tie and undo the top two buttons on his white shirt. He didn't normally wear such formal business attire, but today he had returned from a regional meeting of managers working for his employer, ABC Industries. He wasn't technically a manager, but his role as the most knowledgeable systems analyst on staff required him to attend meetings in Pittsburgh. His immediate supervisor was good at organizing staff, but he knew next to nothing about the computer systems that kept their business running smoothly. He could have stayed home the night before, but that didn't fit into his plans. Instead, he told his wife that the meeting would be followed by a series of seminars that would last all weekend and that he would be back on Monday. He had his own reasons for telling her this, and he had to lose time most of the day so he wouldn't get home too early. He also regretted that he hadn't been able to bring more comfortable clothes with him on the trip. But if he had, Lisa might have wondered why he needed to. He never took anything but formal wear with him to business meetings. Now that he was home, the first order of business was to shower and then change into something more comfortable. Twenty minutes after disappearing upstairs with his garment bag, he returned to the main floor, dressed in his usual jeans and polo shirt, and looking very fresh after a quick shower. The next half hour was spent choosing, warming up, and then eating a meal consisting of leftovers from the fridge. Lisa was a good cook, and even the leftovers made a good meal. He washed down the meal with a bottle of premium light beer, one of his few weaknesses. When he finished the bottle of beer, he moved into the living room where, reclining in a lazy boy chair, he read the front page of the local newspaper. To any casual observer, he was a typical husband, relaxing after a long and arduous trip out of town. In reality, he was just killing time following his script, patiently waiting for the right moment to resolve his serious personal crisis. He'd had a month to work through the five stages of grief alone, and the only one successfully dealt with was denial. Anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance were all in the moment. He hoped that over the course of the night, he would be able to make progress on a few of the remaining four stages. It was past midnight, and Sunday had just been coined when he was finally satisfied with what the clock showed and got up to return the empty bottle of beer to the kitchen counter. He moved the dirty dishes to the dishwasher and then used a damp rag to bring the countertop back to pristine condition. As he took care of these small chores, he realized it was just a form of procrastination, a way to make him reconsider his chosen path. Unable to find a new solution to the problem, he walked over to the hall closet and put on a light jacket, then began to make his way to the side door, the beginning of his nightly mission. When his fingertips touched the doorknob, he suddenly jerked his hand away, snapped his fingers and said, Darn, I almost forgot. He hurried back into the living room, set his briefcase on the coffee table, and then put the laptop on it. In less than a minute, he had the laptop turned on, logged in, and secured an internet connection through the wireless router located in the computer room. He and Lisa kept a few minutes of typing and sending an email, completed. The forgotten business, and after logging out and turning off the laptop, he returned to the side door, walking confidently and leisurely out of the house. After spending about five minutes in the garage, he raised the garage door, drove outside, turned on the headlights, and slowly drove away as the garage door closed silently behind him. It was 7.37 a.m. when Sharpsburg 911 operator answered a new incoming call. 
This is your 911 emergency operator. What is the nature of your emergency? An indistinct female voice, seemingly young, answered over the poor phone connection. I... I think I need the police. I think a crime has been committed. The 911 operator nonchalantly continued. Where are you located, ma'am? We need your location so we can send the police to the call. I... I'm on Park Drive, a payphone on Park Drive near George Washington Park. The word payphone immediately explained the operator's poor connection. What crime has been committed, ma'am? Were you attacked or robbed? The young woman answered with a slight delay. No, it wasn't me. There's nothing wrong with me. It's just... I've just come from a run through the park on the paved access road. The one that leads to the picnic areas. There's a car parked outside one of the picnic areas. The doors are open, the lights are on inside. And there's blood. A lot of blood. The 911 operator was now very interested in the call and asked, Will an ambulance be needed? Are there any injuries? No. No one was hurt there. At least I didn't see anyone there. There's just an empty car in blood. A few seconds passed before the woman continued. I wasn't looking around too much. I was afraid someone would come after me too. So I ran here to the payphone to call you. You did the right thing, I'm sure. A car has already been dispatched and should be on the scene in less than ten minutes. Please wait for the officers so you can let them know exactly where that car is. The caller, seeming a little alarmed, replied, No, I'm not going to wait here. What if whoever did this comes after me? I'm going straight home. The last words were followed by the click of the receiver as she hung up. The 911 operator stared helplessly at the screen where the caller ID flashed as the handset was hung up. Darn it. That must have been her joke. I hope I didn't distract those officers from something more important than a coffee break. It was nearly two o'clock in the afternoon that Sunday, when Detective Peter Nesbitt suddenly straightened abruptly in his seat as the car turned into the driveway of the Evans house. He was already getting out of his unmarked car when the pretty, short-cropped blonde woman driving the car stopped in front of the garage. He quickly crossed the street as she got out of the car and quickly said, Excuse me, I'm looking for Mrs. Evans. She turned around, pulling a suitcase out from under the seat and replied, I'm Lisa Evans. She took another look at the detective and continued, Do I know you? No, ma'am. I'm Detective Peter Nesbitt with the Sharpsburg Police Department. I'm here about your husband, Mark Evans. We're trying to locate him in connection with finding his car abandoned in George Washington Park this morning. He quickly returned the photo ID and badge to his pocket. There was serious concern on Lisa Evans's face for a moment, but then it cleared, and she said, Mark is in Pittsburgh. He always leaves his car at the airport when he goes on trips like this, so I don't know how it could have been found in the park. You must be mistaken. By this time, Detective Nesbitt had approached her and continued, No, we're pretty sure it's his car. Both the license plate and the van matched his registration. Confusion appeared on her face, and she began to walk slowly toward the side door of her house. If it's his car, then it must have been stolen from the airport. I don't know what else I can tell you. The detective was quite insistent and spoke again. When was the last time you spoke to your husband? Could you call him now so we can make sure he's really still in Pittsburgh? Does he have a cell phone you could call? Lisa Evans stopped abruptly and turned to face the detective. She set her overnight bag on the ground beside her and began rummaging through her purse for her cell phone. He called me early yesterday morning from Pittsburgh. If it's okay with you, I'll call him right now. She pressed a few numbers on her cell phone, wanting to show the detective that her husband wasn't in the park. A moment later, a cell phone rang in the detective's jacket pocket. He pulled it out and put it to his ear before saying, Hello, Mrs. Evans. The surprise on Lisa's face was genuine. After a moment when the shock had passed, she asked, How did you get Mark's cell phone? The detective disconnected the phone and was just starting to tuck it away in his jacket pocket when she said, You have to give me my husband's cell phone. It must have gotten lost. I'm afraid I can't. Mrs. Evans, it's now evidence in a possible major crime. It was found on the floor in your husband's car. Lisa became concerned again and asked, Major crime? What do you mean? Your husband's car was found early this morning in the middle of George Washington Park. The doors were open, and there was a bullet hole. We searched the park thoroughly and found no one who could have been a victim. 
We really need to find your husband to rule him out as a victim or perpetrator. Could you try calling him at the hotel in Pittsburgh? Lisa turned toward the house, picked up her briefcase, and said, Sure, I can do that. The hotel number is in my address book. He always stays at the same Holiday Inn. I'm sure he left his cell phone in his car, and that's why he was there when his car was stolen. Come inside with me, and we'll get to the bottom of this right away. Detective Nisbet followed her into the kitchen and watched as she stowed her briefcase and purse, found her notebook, and quickly dialed a number, looking absent-mindedly across the hallway into the living room. He distinctly heard the hotel clerk say hello, hello. As he watched her hang up the receiver back on the phone after hanging up, she turned to the face detective and quickly said Mark was home. His briefcase and laptop are in the living room on the coffee table. I don't understand. The detective stepped back with a thoughtful expression and pulled his own cell phone from his inside pocket. He quickly dialed the number and said, Hi Dave, it's Pete. I need you to get in touch with the DA on duty. I need a search warrant for the Evans house. We'll need to search the place to decide if Mr. Evans is involved in a crime as a victim or potential suspect. Bring it here as soon as you get it. I'll be waiting. He hung up the phone and sat down across from Lisa. A search warrant. Why do you need one? You can look all you want. Just ask for one. I want you to find my husband. Detective Nesbitt looked at Lisa impassively and said, I want to do things by the book, ma'am. If I do an illegal search and your husband is involved in something illegal, anything I find can't be used in court. Lisa got a little angry and quickly replied, Illegal. Mark isn't involved in anything illegal. He works with computers, for God's sake. Well, something made him come back to town unexpectedly. Can you think of a single reason why he was here? Unexpectedly and unbeknownst to you, his wife? Lisa's face lost color again, and she muttered quietly, God, no, he can't. Oh, no. A somewhat panicked expression appeared on her face, and for a few seconds, she was silent, just looking at the detective. Finally, she said, I have no idea why my husband came home early. All I know is that he's not involved in anything illegal. Her look gradually turned to one of complete panic, and she continued, Oh my God. Mark could be heard lying somewhere waiting for help. You have to find him. Seeing how upset she was, Peter Nesbitt's compassionate side took over, and he spoke to her much more gently now. We don't know anything for sure yet, Mrs. Evans. As a police officer, I have to do the right thing. At the moment, there is no evidence that your husband has done anything wrong, or that he is involved in any of this at all. Why don't you make us some coffee while we wait for my partner to get a warrant? There's nothing else we can do right now. All of our on-duty officers are looking for or searching for your husband. His sympathetic tone and comforting words seemed to help Lisa. She began to relax, and the natural color returned to her face. She got up and started making coffee for the two of them. However, her calm state didn't last long, because after his next sentence, Lisa became tense and nervous again. All of this happened when he said, Perhaps while we are having coffee... You can give me the details of how you spent the last 48 hours before the case is closed. We'll probably need statements from everyone even remotely involved. Detective Nesbitt decided to hang around for a few minutes before getting a preliminary statement from Lisa Evans, and she didn't seem interested in broaching the subject herself. Instead, the two of them sat at the kitchen table drinking coffee, while the detective recounted the details of how the car had been discovered and the condition of its interior. Lisa seemed horrified by some of the details, particularly the fact that there was an obvious bullet hole in the center of the thoroughly blood-soaked section of the front passenger seat of her husband's car. He also said that the blood trail suggested that a second bullet had struck the body, which was lying on firewood on the ground next to the car, and that this bullet was now being extracted from the firewood for examination at the crime lab. The car had been towed away for examination, and evidence on it was still being collected. Finally, he reported that the medical examiner and forensic scientist were still examining the scene in detail. They had barely had time to savor the second cup of coffee she had prepared when Detective David Klein, Peter Nesbitt's partner, arrived. Much earlier than expected, with the requested search warrant, he was accompanied by two forensic technicians, and soon, 
all three new arrivals began a systematic and thorough search of the Evans' home and then Lisa's garage and car. While all this was going on, Detective Nesbitt arranged with Lisa to locate her husband's razor and toothbrush so that DNA could be obtained for comparison with the blood evidence already in evidence. Throughout the search, and especially when it came to the DNA comparison, Lisa was in such a depressed state that Detective Nesbitt was forced to take her into the living room, where he asked her to remain seated on the couch while he and the others finished searching the house. After an hour of fruitlessly searching the house, the detectives decided that the only items they would have to return to the station with, other than the DNA samples, were Mark Evans's briefcase and laptop computer. Detective Nesbitt had already figured out that the computer was password protected and they wouldn't be able to access it until they found a way around it. Mrs. Evans, do you happen to know the password your husband used on his laptop? This question seemed to bring Lisa out of her state of despair and intermittent crying, as it seemed like something she could help with. It used to be his first and last name, and then his birth year. Try Mark, 1971. Should work. Unfortunately, it soon became clear that he had changed his password, as none of the variations of the old password worked for the detective. That's all right, Mrs. Evans. We have experienced computer technicians in our forensics department who will find a way around your husband's password. With any luck, it won't take long. The two items were labeled and stowed in the van used by the two forensic technicians. Left alone with Lisa Evans. Detective Nesbitt decided to broach the subject of getting a preliminary statement from her again. So, Mrs. Evans... I need to get some basic information about your whereabouts this weekend. Let's review Saturday morning and your return here this afternoon. He pulled out a notepad and pen and sat down in his chair to write down her description of how she had spent that period of time. Lisa Evans took a deep breath and began, Well, until noon on Saturday. I just did the usual chores around the house. Mark called me from Pittsburgh around 1 o'clock, or maybe 1.30. We only talked for a few minutes. He said he was sorry he couldn't make it for the weekend. After that, I went shopping until about 4.30, and then came home after dinner. Around half past 7 p.m., I went to a friend's house and spent the night. This morning, I got up late, took my time, and got home, as you know, around 2 o'clock. As she explained, she seemed to grow more and more tense, and by the time she finished, she was staring at the floor and clenching her hands into fists. After writing the last word in his notebook, Detective Nesbitt closed it and sat, tapping it with his pen for a few seconds before saying, We may need more details, Mrs. Evans. This is enough for now, but be prepared to provide more details and a closer time, if the course of the case requires it. He slipped the notepad and pen back into his pocket and stood up. Detective Nesbitt was about to leave the house to join the others, who were searching Lisa's garage and car. He was sure that the house had been completely checked when he suddenly realized that there was one more item he needed. Oh, Mrs. Evans, do you have any recent full-length photos of your husband? A good headshot wouldn't hurt either. Right now, we only have a picture of him from the driver's license database. It would be good for us to circulate something less official among the patrolmen, saying that he walked over to the mantel, over the fireplace, and looked at a few wedding photos, while Lisa Evans quickly walked over to a book rack where she picked out a thick photo album. Here are some nice recent photos, detective. Take your pick. She returned to her seat on the couch, and the detective sat next to her as she opened the album. On the last page were several very suitable photos for his purposes, and perhaps the best of them all. To Mark's right was his wife, and to his left was a tall, well-built man with sandy hair. This one will do the detective said, pointing to the group photo. We can cut you and this guy out. After a few seconds, the detective selected another photo, a very good head and shoulders shot of Mark Evans. These two photos will be more than enough for our needs. When Lisa took the two photos out of the book and handed them to the detective, he took another look at them and asked, Isn't the guy in this picture with you and your husband a relative of his? If he has a sibling or parents who could provide a DNA sample, it might help if they can't get anything useful out of a razor or toothbrush. Lisa quickly replied, No, that's Blake Moore. He's my husband's best friend since elementary school. 
My husband has no relatives living nearby, thanking her for the pictures. Detective Nesbitt walked out to join the others in the garage. He left Lisa sitting at the kitchen table, looking wistful and on the verge of tears. He began to think that he felt sorry for the woman and the position she was now in. Her husband was missing and may or may not have been involved in a serious shooting. The fact that she didn't know he was even in town made the detective wonder exactly what was going on. The detectives, along with two forensic experts, soon finished searching the garage and the car. It was when the experts were scrutinizing Lisa's car that they noticed something potentially important and certainly suspicious. Blood stains were found on the gas and brake pedal, which, when chemically analyzed, turned out to be blood. The decision was made to have the car towed to a garage for a thorough inspection and testing, while the two technicians gathered their equipment and prepared to leave. The two detectives stepped aside to discuss their feelings about the case. Detective Nesbitt, standing so that he was facing the side door of the Evans house, turned to his partner. What's your opinion of Mrs. Evans? I wonder about her now and then. And that positive blood test on the pedals in her car makes me wonder. Well... As far as Mrs. Evans is concerned, you have an advantage over me. I was just here on a search. She looked like a typical worried wife. But you know how it is right now. I wouldn't want to put it on the line, whether she's involved in something or just being what she appears to be. Nesbitt suddenly began to stalk toward the side door, saying as he went, Come with me, Dave. Let's see how she reacts when we tell her about the blood we found and that her car is being towed. The two detectives walked to the side door, knocked, and entered. Lisa Evans was talking on her cell phone and became very startled when the two men entered the kitchen. She quickly disconnected the phone without saying a word to whoever was on the other end of the conversation. You're back. I thought you were all done. Peter Nesbitt stepped aside so that his partner had an equal opportunity to observe Lisa Evans. We thought we were done too. However, forensics found blood smears on the brake and accelerator pedal of your car. We're taking your car to the impound lot for a thorough inspection. I hope you don't mind. Lisa looked genuinely shocked as she said blood in my car. How could it have gotten in there? I didn't see any blood anywhere. The two detectives watched her carefully and he replied, That's a question we'll likely want an answer to at this point. We can't know if it's related to the incident in the park, but if it turns out that the blood matches the blood found there, you can be sure we'll be pushing for answers. Oh, and we'll need the shoes you were wearing today. I wasn't anywhere near the park. I haven't been there in weeks. I don't understand how there could have been blood in my car. Certainly my husband's car didn't have the blood you described. As she spoke, she reached down and removed the shoes she was wearing, handing them to Detective Nesbitt. She then slumped down in the seat, covered her face with her hands, and began to sob. Both detectives, realizing there was little they could say or do without more information, bid her farewell, leaving her in the same posture, slumped on the kitchen chair. What do you think, Dave? Is she what she seems to be? A wife who feels strongly about her husband? Or do you think that maybe she's just a really good actress? Did you notice she was on the phone when we came in and hung up on whoever it was? David Klein shook his head and said, I just don't know, Pete. I just don't know. She seems quite sincere. But you know how these things go. If the blood in the car turns out to be the husband's blood, there's a good chance his spouse was involved. We see it over and over again. Maybe we should make some inquiries about this couple. Talk to their friends and neighbors. Maybe someone knows something that has something to do with this whole case. As for the phone call, she was probably talking to her best friend. Women always turn to their best friend when something goes wrong. Yeah, I guess you're right. Good old-fashioned digging can lead to something. I'd like to find out why he came into town two days earlier than expected. That could be the key to solving this whole case. Upon reaching the car, Detective Nesbitt pulled out a plastic evidence bag, put a pair of shoes in it, and sealed the bag tightly. Since the two partners arrived separately, they each had their own car. As they drove back to the station, each alone, they individually tried to make sense of the clues that had been presented to them. Unfortunately, neither of them had enough to come up with anything better than what they had already discussed for the rest of the shift. Both of them were busy writing reports and other paperwork. 
no new information came out of the lab before they left for home, so all they had to do was mull over what they had already learned that day. The next morning, Peter and Dave arrived half an hour early. It was obvious that the Mark Evans case was high on their agenda. Fortunately, their dedication to their work was rewarded. They were greeted by a stack of reports from the forensics and medical examiner's office. It took them an hour to read through the reports, passing them to each other as they digested the information they had received. Once they were done with what awaited them, they both realized that there were more reports to come. Looking over one of the reports, Peter Nesbitt said to his partner, they seem to be pointing in the same direction, don't they? But it looks like there are a few more reports ahead of us this morning, so I don't think we should rush into it. I'd hate to let things go to waste. David Klein nodded as his partner spoke and replied, I think you're right. Let's see if they can extract anything else from the computer. In the meantime, we can go out and talk to his lawyer and some of the people he's been working with. I'm not sure we have enough probable cause to make an arrest yet. We need to take some formal statements before we talk to the DA. Both men were in complete agreement with each other and went to the office of attorney Mark Evans just after nine in the morning, like everyone in the legal community. Robert Graham didn't want to appear biased against the police, especially during an investigation. He was quick to give them a few minutes of his time. You do realize that I can't discuss anything pertaining to my client's legal situation, so let's hear what you want from me so I can decide whether or not to answer your questions. The lawyer leaned back in his chair and waited. Detective Nesbitt spoke quickly, not wanting to waste too much of the attorney's precious time. We have several emails here that we obtained under a search warrant from Mark Evans, his computer. Could you please confirm their receipt? We just need to know that these emails were actually sent to you in the last couple of weeks. We want to be sure they're not just rough copies. He held out four pieces of paper to the lawyer. The lawyer quickly looked over each one and then replied, It appears that these are indeed originals. I can confirm receipt of each of them. He handed them back to the detective, who immediately stood up and said, Thank you, Mr. Graham. That's all we need. We can't make decisions about the investigation based on what these letters tell us without some sort of confirmation that they are genuine. The two detectives walked out of the office, exchanging smiles and headed to their car. As they drove to ABC Industrial, Peter Nesbitt said to his partner, Like you said yesterday, situations like this usually involve the spouse. However, we have a few more bridges to cross. When they arrived at Mark Evans's place of employment, both detectives were quickly ushered into the office of his immediate supervisor. This time, it was Detective Klein who did the talking. We're investigating the discovery of an automobile in George Washington Park yesterday. You probably read about it in this morning's paper. The car belonged to one of your employees, Mark Evans. We have a few questions that you may be able to help us with. Mark's boss quickly assured them that he would do his best to help them. He said that Mark was considered a very valuable employee, and anything that could be done to solve the mystery of his abandoned car would be perfectly acceptable. First, I would like to know if Mark will be staying in Pittsburgh until Friday night. He reportedly had seminars scheduled for Saturday and Sunday. We need to know if that's the case. His boss quickly replied, Mark certainly didn't have any events scheduled for the weekend. I fully expected him to be back Friday night. Detective Klein nodded, made a note in his notebook, and continued. Have you noticed anything about Mark that seemed a little off lately? We're wondering if he might have had something on his mind, something that stood out. The man sitting at the table thought for a moment, then replied, Mark seems to have been carrying more on his shoulders lately. I asked him a couple of weeks ago if he was having any problems at that time. He replied that everything was fine. I've also noticed that he's been brooding a lot. I just assumed he was working hard solving our problems, but I think he might have other concerns. The detectives thanked him and then quickly headed back to their car. A picture was emerging, and both knew that by the end of the day, there was a good chance that they would be able to make significant progress on the case. By late morning, they returned to the office and found that the preliminary DNA results had been received. In addition, there was a strange-looking box with wires dangling from it on the desk, and the forensic report was on top of it. 
Both detectives found this particularly interesting, especially when combined with some printed maps the computer technician had given them. Another gap had been filled, and the picture was becoming clearer and clearer. Taking their accumulated information, printouts, and notepads, they went to spend a couple hours in one of the empty interrogation rooms. By the time they came out of there, they thought they had a pretty good understanding of what had happened in the park. Although there were still some very large gaps in the matter, they decided it was time to pay another visit to Lisa Evans. This time, they felt they had enough information to ask her some tough questions. Depending on the answers they received, there might be a reason to call her in for an official statement. The detectives pulled up to the Evans house a little after three in the afternoon. They didn't call ahead, fearing that she would have time to prepare for their arrival. They wanted to take her by surprise. They went to the front door and rang the doorbell, as any normal visitor would. Lisa Evans seemed more than a little startled when she saw the two of them standing at the door. Detectives. Have you found my husband? I called the sergeant every two hours, and he keeps saying I have nothing to report. Detective Nesbitt replied, No, we haven't found your husband yet. However, we have made some progress. We would like to come in and ask you a few questions, if you don't mind. Lisa Evans looked a little embarrassed, but then stepped back and said, Sure, come on in. I'll do my best to help you find Mark. She walked into the living room, and the two men followed her when she sat down on the couch. Each of the detectives took a seat in one of the chairs across from her. Detective Klein, opening his notebook, began the conversation by asking, Is there anything you want to tell us about your relationship with Blakemore? Both detectives decided that such a question asked head-on might cause Lisa Evans to reveal something she might prefer to withhold. The decision was immediately vindicated when Lisa Evans quickly turned white and said, What? What do you mean about my relationship with Blake? He's my husband's best friend. He's always hanging out with Mark, but he's just my friend. Her eyes darted back and forth between the two detectives. Now, Detective Nesbitt joined them. Are you or are you not having an affair with Blake? More? The detective had asked the question calmly and evenly, and now sat waiting for an answer. It was unlikely, but both detectives later agreed that she seemed to grow even paler with the second question. Her mouth silently opened and closed several times before she said, Absolutely not. How can you come here and ask me such questions? Both detectives immediately stood up, and Detective Klein said, I think you're going to have to make your way down to the station. We're going to take a formal statement from you. Lisa clearly began to panic. What? I'm under arrest. Why do I have to go to the station with you? You're not under arrest yet. We have reason to believe that you have not been forthright with us, and we want an official statement from you. You'll be able to ask for an attorney if you want one. Lisa frantically shifted her gaze from one detective to the other and quickly replied, I don't need a lawyer. I haven't done anything. If you want me to come down to the station to answer your questions, fine, I will. I will do whatever it takes to help you find my mark. Lisa Evans stood up quickly to escort the detectives to their car for the trip downtown. She was walking ahead of them, so she didn't notice Pete giving Dave the thumbs-up sign after placing her in the back seat. The two men took their seats in front and drove back to the police station in silence. Arriving at the station, the detectives slowly led Lisa Evans upstairs to an interrogation room and then into one of the empty interrogation rooms. They chose the darkest room they could find. It needed to be repainted and new furniture put in. They wanted to create as negative an environment as possible. We'll ask you to wait here for a few minutes while we gather our documents. Are you sure you don't want to talk to a lawyer? Detective Nesbitt was giving her every opportunity to make a decision, but this time she refused. Shaking her head quickly, she still looked very beautiful against the dreary surroundings, though her blue eyes were full of tears. She sank heavily into one of the chairs, and the detective left the room, closing the door behind him. Make sure both cameras are on for the entire time we're with her. I need a good recording of everything that's going to be said in there. I have a feeling we're going to solve this case and I don't want to miss a word of what she's going to say. Detective Klein was talking to his commanding officer, the man who would be recording and personally testifying to what was said in the interrogation room. 
Just then, Peter Nesbitt walked up with a backlog of files. He was contemplating the upcoming interrogation of Lisa Evans and said, Let's have a coffee first. Let her have a little time to reflect. Everyone quickly agreed, and the three men left to spend the next twenty minutes in the staff coffee shop discussing the case and how they would handle her interrogation. Life does not run in a single linear rhythm. Countless events occur in overlapping timelines, while the two detectives were talking to Mark Evans, his manager. That morning, a volunteer on the other side of town answered the Crime Stopper's phone. Good morning. This is your local Crime Stopper's office. We pay up to $1,000 cash for good tips. Unsolved crimes. How can you help us fight crime? Please be advised that this call is being recorded. There was no answer for a few seconds, and the volunteers sitting at the phone figured there was no one there. But before she hung up, an older man said, Is this the place where I can get money if I help the police? Well, sir, it depends on what you tell us the type of crime, and how much the police think you contributed to solving it. Do you have any information about the crime? There was silence again for a few moments before the caller spoke. So now I don't get the money. I have to wait. What if the cops want to trick me out of my money? What then? Well, sir, we need to know for sure that you helped. The money isn't coming from the police, so they have no reason to try to scam you. Sir, why don't you tell me what you know? and I'll give you the code number for later. You can call me back in a few days, and I'll tell you if the information helped you. And how much it will cost? The man got a little indignant. I need the juice now. I need the money now. Well, sir, that's the way it is. What do you mean? You need juice? If you're homeless and need food, I can give you the addresses of several shelters where you can eat. I don't need any darn food. I need juice. You know, grape juice that sells for five bucks a bottle. The woman grinned to herself, but said to the man, I'm afraid I can't help you now, but if you have good information, you could probably afford many bottles of grape juice. Okay, I'll wait. I saw someone throw a gun into the river. I was under the Third Street Bridge, just minding my own business on a Sunday morning. At least I think it was a Sunday morning when some guy pulled up to the public access point. When he came out, he had a shotgun and two shovels in his hands. He threw it all into the river right in front of me. I was terrified. I'll tell you, I was sure he was going to see me and shoot me with the gun. The cameraman was mildly interested in what the old man had told her, and she asked, Was this in the parking lot on the east side of the Third Street Bridge? Did he throw them in the water? Yes, that's the place. And no, he just threw them over the end of that little dock there. They shouldn't have any trouble finding the weapons. He hesitated before adding, I can describe him too. He was large, with blonde hair, not blonde, just blonde. And his car? It was dark blue, and the license plate started with A, but I forget the rest. Jimmy came over with juice and shared, so I forgot part of it. But the rest of it is correct. I lived in Arizona, and at one time I had a Chevy Impala SS. That's how I remember it. The woman had written down all the information and was now ready to end the conversation. Well, sir... I think I have everything we need. I will now give you a number for you to memorize. The number is 127. Call back in a few days and tell me you're calling about tip number 127, and I'll tell you if it helps the police. We might even find out how much that information is worth. If it's worth money to you, we'll tell you where you can pick it up anonymously. The call ended quickly, and the Crime Stoppers operator relayed the information to the police liaison officer, to whom she reported. That person decided that they would send out a diver as soon as possible. Since getting guns off the streets was one of the mayor's top priorities, as it turned out, the police diver arrived on the scene in no more than an hour. And it took only a few minutes to find three items thrown into the river. Reports were completed and then forwarded to Crime Stoppers. By 2.30, the shovels were at the property clerk's office, and the gun was turned over to the crime lab to see if it matched any unsolved crimes in the city. When the gun was turned into the lab, it was quickly noted that the caliber and type of jacketed ammunition still in the gun matched perfectly with the recent crime scene in George Washington Park. Within minutes, the gun was inspected in detail and a test bullet was fired for comparison. It was immediately apparent that it matched a bullet recovered from a bundle of firewood found in the park. 
A report was immediately sent upstairs to the detectives handling the case, and a technician went to retrieve the two shovels from the property clerk. Just as different chains of events can run parallel, they can also intersect. And that's exactly what happened when the detectives and their commanding officer walked out of the staff coffee shop. They were met outside the door by the clerk, who was delivering the ballistics and Crime Stoppers reports. Detectives, I was just bringing this information to you. We have the gun that was used in the George Washington Park shooting. The attached Crime Stoppers report also has some information for you. It might even lead you directly to the perpetrator. The smirking clerk at the crime lab handed both reports to the surprised detectives and headed back to his department. Detectives Klein and Nesbitt took turns reviewing the two reports. Within seconds, they were already sitting side by side in front of a computer terminal, calling up records from the vehicle registration department. When they were finished, a brief conversation ensued between them. Pete, I'd like to suggest we split up. If you want, I'll start questioning our guest in the interrogation room, and you can get a uniformed officer and go get Mr. Moore. He needs to be brought here for questioning, too. Sounds like a plan, Dave. Things are shaping up just right, aren't they? Detective Klein, picking up the accumulated reports and information, headed for the interrogate room where Lisa Evans continued to wait. Meanwhile, his partner was talking to his commanding officer, asking him to help a uniformed officer pay a surprise visit to Blake Moore. Soon, he was on his way out the door, and a patrol car was to meet him at Moore's house. When Detective Klein entered the interview room, Lisa Evans sat calmly at the desk, her face expressing neither sadness nor fear. She seemed to be stoically awaiting her fate, whatever it might be. I'm sorry to keep you waiting, Mrs. Evans. I'm ready to get to work. Please be aware that this room is monitored by two video cameras and everything we say and do is being recorded. She looked at him with some surprise and replied, I don't mind if you record us. I have nothing to hide. Shuffling the papers, he replied, That's good. Then we can get started. He leaned back in his chair and glanced at her briefly before getting down to business. I'll start where we ended our conversation. At your house. I'll say it again. Are you having an affair with Blake Moore? Yes or no? His decision to get to the heart of the matter again had a noticeable effect on her. Her shoulders slumped slightly, and she turned her head so that she would no longer meet the detective's gaze. After a few seconds, she said in a quiet voice, Yes. Detective Klein tore a few pages from the pile of papers in front of him. It's good that you've decided to be straight with me. We have evidence of your affair printed from your husband's laptop. His statement seemed to shock her. She raised her head and looked him straight in the eye again. What do you mean you have proof? No one knew about Blake and me. Your husband certainly knew, as you can see in these pages. Here is the letter he sent to his attorney almost a month ago, telling him he wanted him to start preparing the papers for a divorce on the grounds of adultery. Here is a map from two weeks ago that clearly shows the route you took that day with timestamps indicating that you spent two hours at Blake Moore's house. Here's a copy of the email your husband sent to his attorney that day, telling how you lied when he called you in the afternoon and told you you were home. One by one, the sheets of paper slid across the desk and laid down in front of the seated woman. She looked over the papers and the detective several times, then took each one in her hands and made sure that each one depicted exactly what the detective was talking about. Finally, she spoke. How? How did Mark do it? How could he know where I am? This map. She picked up the detailed map and traced the route that was clearly marked on it, showing how she had traveled from her home to her lovers. I don't know how your husband found out about this, but something made him install this device in your car. He picked up a small black device, smaller than a pack of cigarettes, and held it out to her. It had the name P-200 embossed on its side and Rocky Mountain tracking below it. He bought it online along with the unlimited tracking option and was able to use his laptop to get a complete, real-time history of your whereabouts, with full addresses and date and time stamps. He could tell you where your car was every minute of every day since he installed that device under the dashboard. She stared at the small, innocent-looking electronic device as if it were a scorpion ready to sting her. You mean Mark knew about us for weeks? Oh my God. And he wanted a divorce. 
She began to cry again, and the detective looked away for a moment to pick up the papers and tracking device, which he had stacked in a separate pile beside him. Of course, he listed the time and location of all four of your communications with his friend over the past month. The last map was created just after midnight on Saturday, the night he went missing. Around the same time, he sent an email to his lawyer, telling him he was going to go to Moore's and confront the two of you. He told his lawyer that he feared he would be arrested if he broke into the house or got into a fight with your lover, his supposed friend. She looked at the detective again and said, But, but he never went there. I spent the night there, but Mark never showed up. Something must have happened to him before he got to Blake's house. The detective seemed to be well prepared for the statement, for he quickly said, I'm sure something happened to him. That's correct. Preliminary DNA results confirmed that the blood in the park is his, and we just found the gun that was used. We can link the gun to your lover, and the only question now is how long you're going to cover it up. Blake. Blake didn't do anything to Mark. I was with him the whole time, and he didn't leave that night. Her eyes turned to the detective again as she continued. We were together all night in his bed. The detective pulled a few more pages from his stack and said, We have more. The blood in your car and on your shoes, I might add, also belongs to your husband. My partner is on his way to pick up Mr. Moore now, and will soon find out if his story matches yours. There's a little thing called prosecutorial discretion. Whichever one of you two tells us what really happened and where we can find your husband's body, we'll get a better offer at sentencing. He handed her the blood test reports across the table, but she barely glanced at them. Mark is not dead. He can't be dead. I love him. I need him. She sobbed again, and was clearly very upset. Blake will tell you the same thing I did if my husband got hurt in the park. We had nothing to do with it. She continued to hide her face with her hands as she cried. She had a crumpled and very wet handkerchief in her left hand. Detective Klein gave her a few minutes to come to her senses, and in the meantime, he again took up his reports lying before her, and selected a few more with which he intended to shock her when she came to her senses. When she seemed to come to her senses a little, he said, There is no doubt that your husband is dead. The medical examiner has thoroughly examined the scene and has concluded that, based on the blood loss and the fact that your husband was not treated at any facility in the county, there is a greater than 95% chance that he is dead. He handed her across the table the appropriate report, and several 8x10 photos of the gory scene. One of the photos touched her elbow, and she took her hands away from her face to look at it. It seemed to her that every square inch of the photograph showed blood, though it was actually somewhat smaller. She immediately burst into tears again, and the detective checked his documentation once more before gathering everything into a pile, picking her up and heading for the door. I'll leave you alone for a few minutes, so you can come to your senses. You're really not doing yourself any favors by not taking responsibility for what happened. Detective Klein placed the stack of evidentiary reports on his desk, shook his head as he passed his commanding officer, and made his way to the break room for a fresh cup of coffee. His commander continued to glance periodically at the monitor that displayed the interior of the interrogation room and made sure that the female detainee remained intact as he left the station. Detective Nesbitt immersed himself in thoughts about the Mark Evans case. Apparently, they had gotten enough information from the forensics department to solve it soon. He also pondered whether Blake Moore would still be in town if he had any idea how much evidence the department already had. He'd probably be tempted to run away from their jurisdiction. He pulled up to Moore's house almost at the same time as the patrol car that was supposed to back him up. The two policemen knew each other, and exchanged pleasantries as they headed for the front door. Detective Nesbitt was almost surprised when their knock was quickly answered by Blake Moore, the man I... The two strangers at his door curiously, one wearing a police uniform and the other holding a badge and ID. Yes, officers. What can I do for you? The detective quickly replied. I'm Detective Nesbitt, and I'm here about the disappearance of Mark Evans. We'd like you to join us at the station for questioning. We have Mrs. Evans there right now, and questions have arisen that will require your participation. The tall, well-built, and rough-looking man quickly asked, Am I under arrest or something? I know that Mark is missing as I have spoken to his wife. 
However, I'm not quite sure what you think I can tell you about that. We have a number of questions that we think you may be able to help us with. If you don't mind, we'd like you to come with us. Even though you're not under arrest. Blakemore seemed too stunned to offer any real resistance to their request, and quickly joined them on their way to an unmarked car driven by Detective Nesbitt. Once there, he calmly accepted their invitation to sit in the back seat and was not at all surprised that both the detective and the uniformed officer sat in the front seat. Department protocol requires that when dealing with a potentially violent suspect, two police officers be brought in for backup. The detective first turned to his uniformed partner. We'll have one of the patrol cars take you to a patrol car later. When the formalities were over, Detective Nesbitt turned to Blake Moore and asked, Tell me, Mr. Moore, how well do you know Mrs. Evans? Their passenger quickly replied, She's just Mark's wife to me. I've known her since he met her. Why do you ask? Just wondering, sir. What do you do anyway, Mr. Moore? Blake Moore seemed to relax a little when the question was asked, and replied, I have a small landscaping company, Moore's Landscaping. We do a lot of commercial work. You've probably seen some of them, as we've even done work for the city. Their conversation continued until they arrived at the police station, where Blake Moore was escorted to an interrogation room next to the one where Lisa Evans was being held. He, too, was asked to wait alone while the detective gathered up the folders that Detective Klein had placed on his desk a few minutes ago. Within a couple minutes, a conversation had already begun between Blake Moore and Detective Nesbitt. That was entirely consistent with the interrogation of Lisa Evans that had just ended. At first, he denied that he was having an affair with Lisa Evans, but the emails and surveillance reports soon had him changing his viewpoint. He quickly admitted that they had an affair that lasted almost four months. He adamantly denied that they had done anything to Mark Evans, and insisted that neither of them had left his home the night Lisa's husband disappeared. As detective, Nesbitt continued to press the suspect, categorically denying his involvement in Mark Evans' disappearance. A new theory about what happened in the park was floated. I had nothing to do with anything that happened in that park. If Mark had found out about Lisa and I, he probably would have gone into a rage, and there's no telling what he might have done. He might even have hired his own killer and paid him to make it look like Lisa and I were involved. He and I had a history of things like my relationship with Lisa. What do you mean, Mr. Moore? We have the gun that was used and the witness described you and your car and stated that you were responsible for throwing the gun in the river. He even gave most of the license plate number of your car. Don't try to make up a fairy tale that Mark Evans committed an elaborate suicide to frame you and his wife. Blake Moore became very agitated and replied, You don't know, Mark. He and I have been best friends since elementary school, but I've known for years that I'd rather not mess with his girlfriend and now his wife. We were seniors in high school and I did it once. I took out one of his girlfriends behind his back, and when he found out later that I entertained her while they were dating, he got so mad, he scared me. I'm much bigger than him, and I've always been stronger. But he scared me. He then warned me that he wouldn't tolerate it anymore, and that I would be a dead man. The detective listened to this statement with faint amusement on his face. So you're saying that you were actually afraid of what he would do if he found out, but you had fun with his wife anyway. That doesn't make any sense, Blake already said more calmly. Silly, isn't it? I just couldn't resist her. It's slowly built up between us over the years, and finally a few months ago, I made a serious move on her. We've been seeing each other periodically ever since. I can't imagine how he could have guessed. We've been so careful. The detective looked through the stack of reports before continuing. Yeah, it was stupid. Sometimes I think half of our murders and suicides involve stupidity like that. The old eternal triangle. Only thing is, in this case, I think you and Lisa are the perpetrators. You can tell us what happened. Did he take you by surprise and things got out of hand? Or maybe you planned the whole thing from the beginning so you could be together and not worry about him finding out or not. I don't believe that he organized his own murder. It's too weird. He already had a lawyer arranging his divorce. So why would he suddenly resort to that? I don't know what happened. All I know is that Lisa and I had nothing to do with it. As for wanting to be together, it was out of our hands. 
She and I both knew it was just a fling, and it wouldn't last. As they say, the rose had already bloomed. Detective Nesbitt leaned forward and said, We have enough probable cause to get a search warrant for your home, car, and office. I wouldn't be surprised if it's already happening. You'd better come clean before we put the final nail in your coffin. I'm going to make you the same offer I'm sure my partner made to your lover. Tell us first what happened, and you'll get a leniency in sentencing. There's no point in keeping your mouth shut and getting the maximum. Use your head and do yourself a favor. Blake Moore was outraged. I had nothing to do with what happened to Mark. Maybe Lisa organized something herself. But if she did, I don't know anything about it. The detective picked up his papers, never answering the suspect's latest theory. Leaving the room, he said. It's understandable when two criminals work together. One always tries to pin the blame on the other. You can relax a little bit, because I don't think you'll be leaving any time soon. Exiting the interview room, Detective Nesbitt found his partner waiting for him with another report in hand. It's getting better and better. The two shovels found in the river are stamped that they belong to Moore's landscaping. Wow. Why do these guys always think we'll never find out what happened? A few minutes later, the two detectives were explaining to the district attorney what evidence they had collected, even though they didn't have a body, and the evidence was somewhat circumstantial. It didn't take them long to convince him that there was enough evidence to press charges. Half an hour later, Lisa Evans and Blake Moore were charged with the murder of Mark Evans. Both loudly proclaimed their innocence while their Miranda rights were read to them, but were told that everything was now in the hands of the prosecution and the court system. This information did not comfort either of them. After the arraignment, Lisa and Blake were escorted to the main floor of the police station to be fingerprinted and photographed with an order number. The instruction not to smile for the photos was completely unnecessary, as Blake was frowning angrily the whole time, and Lisa could hardly cry and smile at the same time as they were led back to the neighboring cells. They got their first chance to talk to each other since their arraignment. What are we going to do, Blake? They can't believe we did anything to Mark, can they? Lisa still snorted occasionally, but for the most part, it was gone. We'll have to get our own lawyers, I suppose. Unless you want to share one with me, it might be cheaper. And since we're both accused of the same thing, it makes a certain amount of sense. But this whole darn situation is completely wrong. I just know Mark did something to set us up. I think the jerk paid for someone to film him, and then left a trail of breadcrumbs for the cops to charge us. Mark was obviously still very angry. You can't believe he could do that, can you? Lisa was showing shock bordering on outrage at such a suggestion. Why would Mark go to such a heinous extreme as murder? I don't think you knew your husband as well as you think you did, Lisa. I'm just amazed he didn't do something drastic to the two of us. The same day he found out we were having an affair. It's a real mystery to me. I've known Mark for too many years to think he would put up with this for so long if I thought for one second that he would somehow find out about us. I wouldn't lay a finger on you for anything in the world. He then proceeded to tell her about what had happened years ago, when he had pranked his girlfriend behind Mark's back. They were now in their cells, separated by a six-inch concrete wall, but could talk to each other easily and freely, as they each stood at the bars against the block wall. I don't believe Mark is capable of doing something like this. I also don't know how or when he found out about it. I've never noticed him treating me any differently. Most of the times we met, he was out of town, and we never went out in public together. The couple times we did meet were when he was actually in town, and that was at that little motel on the north side of town. Lisa replied. After some thought, she continued, I shouldn't have betrayed him, even if he's not dead. He'll still want a divorce. Her voice trailed off several times during the last sentence as she clearly became emotional again. Blake managed to listen to a couple of sobs before he spoke. God, Lisa, stop it. You had to imagine how it would end if he ever caught us together. The first time you came to my house and found yourself with your legs spread in the middle of my bed. Your eyes were open. His words had the desired effect, and her sniffling stopped. After a few seconds, she said in a very quiet voice, You're right. I can only hope he will forgive me. They were silent for a couple more minutes before Lisa suggested I could call Robert Graham. He was our attorney, 
and if he represents both of us, we could split the costs. They agreed to this legal solution, and after a few minutes, when she managed to get the attention of a passing officer, she was escorted into a small private room with a telephone and a phone book for her use. The call to Robert Graham was not as straightforward as she had expected. He informed her that as he was already Mark's attorney and the pending divorce proceedings, he would not be comfortable representing her. He suggested that one of his colleagues, Basil Smith, a lawyer with extensive experience in criminal cases, would be a good fit as their attorney. She quickly agreed, and it was agreed that the new attorney would come to see them right away to consult. Blake was pleased to hear that the lawyer was on his way, and thanked her for calling. They both sat down on a wooden bench attached to the back wall of their enclosures, and spent the next hour waiting, indulging in their own personal reflections. When Basil Smith arrived, they were both escorted into a small room designated for attorney-client meetings. Basil Smith was quite a lawyer. He was short, stocky, with a mop of dark hair fringing his bald head. At least he didn't believe in the dreaded hairstyle. A dark blue pinstripe suit completed the image of a fifty-year-old legal professional. The introductions were quick, and the two nervous prisoners waited while he carefully scanned the copies of documents detailing the charges against them that he'd been handed upon arrival. Once he was done with that, he raised his head to look at his two new clients in turn and said, So you're both charged with the murder of Mark Evans? What can you tell me about what the arresting officers told you both? You first, Mrs. Evans. Just the big picture, please. I just want to have some idea of what we have. Lisa began to recount an abbreviated form. What had happened since Detective Nesbitt had met her in the driveway on Sunday afternoon? By the time she told about being fingerprinted and sketched, she was crying again between sobs. She ended her statement by saying, I had nothing to do with what happened in that park. I love Mark. I couldn't hurt him. Basil Smith considered her words for a moment, then turned to Blake and said, You turned around. I don't need all those little details. Blake Moore briefly recounted what had happened since the police had arrived at his home that afternoon, and his story was far from tearful. He ended his story by saying, Lisa and I had nothing to do with Mark's disappearance or what happened in the park. I told Lisa and the police officers the same thing, and now I'm going to tell you, Mark Evans organized this. Somehow I believe he paid to have it taken out, and part of the deal was that whoever did the job agreed to frame Lisa and me. He glared at the lawyer as if challenging him to disagree with his explanation. When Blake repeated his certainty that Mark was dead, Lisa began sobbing again. The lawyer cast a brief glance at her, then said, This is not the time to argue our case to each other. First of all, we need to consider what we can do to get you both out of here. We have to consider your bail from what you both have told me, and from what I see in this set of charges. I believe they will ask for bail of about $100,000, for each of you. Will bail be a problem? Lisa looked shocked and asked, Will I need $100,000 for bail? She was ready to panic, knowing she didn't have anywhere near that amount in assets. No, 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 Lisa. You will only need 10% or $10,000 cash to post a $100,000 bail bond in this state. You are not required to post the entire amount unless the judge directs it. The attorney was quick to tell her. After explaining this, they decided that neither of them would have any difficulty in posting bail. And naturally, they were very much interested in whether they could get out on bail immediately. You will be arraigned tomorrow morning, and bail will be set at that time. You will also be able to make the necessary arrangements to get out of here. You'll both be spending the night here, so get used to the idea. Both of his clients reacted badly to this statement. The lawyer informed them that there was nothing more he could do until charges were filed. Once the task of getting them out of their cells was accomplished, he would try to talk to the district attorney to get the evidence unsealed. It seemed to him that he would better understand their predicament if he knew what facts they were dealing with. They were both taken back to their cells where neither of them slept that night. They were each given greasy takeout food for dinner one blanket for the night, and loud cellmates in the middle of the night. None of them looked particularly trim when they met with their attorney the next morning, at ten o'clock, before their first court appearance. None of the court staff, 
not even the judge, seemed particularly concerned about their appearance, as their pleas of not guilty were accepted, and bail was set at the expected one hundred thousand dollars. Since Blake had both a home and a business, he was able to quickly negotiate a ten thousand dollars bond with the court and was back on the street by early afternoon. Lisa, however, was less fortunate. Unlike Blake, she didn't have sole ownership of their home, so that was out of the question. To her shock, she discovered that the savings account she expected to have over $20,000 in it was now empty. Without it, she could not get the required bond and ended up calling her parents in desperation. Explaining to her parents the need for bail was one of the most difficult things she had ever had to do. Only after much persuasion on her part did they finally agree to reimburse the court for the missing $10,000. By the time Lisa had secured her parents' help, it was too late to do the final paperwork, and she spent a second night in a cell. This time, her roommates were a pair of slightly tipsy prostitutes. She spent most of the night sleepless, hunched in a corner covered by a single blanket. By noon the next day, with all financial matters resolved, she was finally allowed to leave the station and return to her empty house. She immediately showered, got into bed, and ignored the few phone calls that came in, leaving the answering machine to take care of them. The next month went by rather quickly for the two defendants. In the first few days, Lisa learned that the money missing from the bank account she and her husband shared had been withdrawn by him about ten days prior to her disappearance. Her attorney discovered that an email had been sent to his partner, Robert Graham, in which Mark explained that he was withdrawing money from the account in cash so that his wife would not be able to forfeit his legal share. When she received the divorce papers, there was no indication of what he did with the cash. Although his message said that he would give up his share once an appropriate agreement was reached with Lisa on the terms of their divorce. Lisa and Blake met with Basil Smith on several occasions, during which he informed them that he had met with the district attorney, had received copies of various reports and summaries of evidence, and planned to bring his clients to meet with the district attorney in hopes of getting all charges dismissed. He believed that the absence of a body or witness to cross-examine would make it very difficult to obtain a conviction. Shortly after his bail during their first meeting, he suggested that they hire a private investigator to try to determine if it could somehow be proven that Mark himself contributed to his death or disappearance. Blake gladly agreed to the suggestion, although Lisa still didn't believe that Mark could have had anything to do with what had happened. She put forward the theory that Mark had been the victim of a botched carjacking. According to her, it made as much sense as Blake's theory. Even though she theorized about the carjacking, she still didn't want to admit that all signs pointed to Mark no longer being alive. Over the next few weeks, they received regular reports from the hired detective, but they were all very similar. He was finding nothing. Basil Smith also suggested that the detective try to find the old winemaker who had reported the discarded shotgun and shovels. Basil had gotten a copy of the Criminal Information Service recording of the call, and the detective used it as he surveyed the neighborhoods favored by down-and-out people. No one he spoke to recognized the voice. It also seemed odd that the tipster never called to see if tip number 127 would help him stay juiced for a while. I had to admit the possibility that the caller simply forgot the number, or maybe even forgot that he had reported the tip. Also, this population was very mobile and moved from one area to another depending on factors such as whether police presence and sources of quick cash. Although he never talked about it, Basil Smith began to notice that his two clients didn't seem to get along with each other anymore. Neither of them had told him this willingly, but shortly after his bail, Blake had suggested to Lisa that since Mark was now off the case, they could meet as often as they wanted at either of their homes. Her response was swift and decisive. I want nothing to do with you, except our court case. You kept pushing and pushing for me, and like a fool, I gave in. Now I've lost Mark. Her reply ended with another fit of tears, which she seemed to repeat often, almost without provocation. Blake's reply was succinct and definitive. Suit yourself. Lisa, you're not the only woman in town. They had not spoken since, except in the company of their lawyer, where a continued feud would have been disadvantageous to both of them. 
the ashes of their illicit affair were now icy cold. A little over a month after their release, Basil Smith arranged a meeting with District Attorney Jeff Bagman for all of them to attend. Lisa and Blake went to the meeting hoping the charges would be dropped. They had both been repeatedly harassed by calls and questioned by friends and acquaintances about the nature of their relationship. They both began screening their calls with caller ID and answering machines. Clearing the charges would allow them to move on with their lives. Lisa and Blake were surprised at how young, stylish, and casual Jeff bagged and looked. He could pass for their lawyer son, except he had a full head of dark hair. The district attorney began to speak as soon as all four were seated. I'm glad we were able to meet so easily. I just received the final reports from the medical examiner today, and the police and medical examiner's reports are in. I have carefully reviewed all of the evidence and believe I am serving the people properly by offering you a reduced sentence of 8 to 12 years for agreeing to plead guilty to second-degree murder. The faces of the two defendants, and to some extent their attorney, reflected shock and awe. Lisa and Blake began loudly proclaiming their innocence, while their attorney alternately tried to silence them and ask the district attorney how he could justify the offer. When everyone was quiet, Jeff bagged and began. Since the first charges were filed, I have received new reports and information. I will provide Mr. Smith with copies of the new information right away. The first is the DNA report of the blood samples taken from the back of the license plate and from the rubber gasket on the trunk lid of your car, Mr. Moore. Both samples contained Mark Evans's DNA. The samples were taken pursuant to a search warrant before you posted bail. In addition, the scrap of black polyethylene found under the rear tire of Mark Evans' car matches the make and style used in your landscaping business. At this point, the prosecutor stopped talking, deciding to watch the reaction of the two defendants. Lisa seemed more angry than shocked, while Blake still seemed to be digesting the implications of the facts. The prosecutor had just stated. Lisa cut into the conversation. Blake, what have you done? She seemed ready to continue her accusations, but Basil Smith immediately managed to insist on her silence. Blake reacted very quickly to her accusation. He exploded. You know perfectly well that I had nothing to do with it. You were beside me in my bed when it happened. That was all he had time to say before Basil grabbed his arm and explicitly told him to shut up. The attorney's next words were intended for the district attorney. Please excuse my clients, Jeff. We came here hoping the charges would be dropped, and your statement caught them both off guard. Jeff bagged and seemed mildly amused by the spectacle put on by the two defendants. I understand, Basil. I was in private practice, but the fact remains that we have more than enough evidence to bring this case to trial. The medical examiner's report clearly states that the victim lost too much blood to stay alive, and the crime scene reports can be interpreted to mean that the body was dragged away from the scene and loaded into a car. I'm comfortable with this case from the prosecution's point of view. The district attorney stood up, pulled a folder of reports from his briefcase, handed them to Basil Smith, and promptly left the room. As soon as the door closed behind the departing DA, Lisa and Blake began talking hurriedly to their attorney. The man couldn't make either of them out and had to tell them both to shut up. The fact that their own lawyer told them to shut up was startling enough to make both of them comply. I know you're both shocked and upset by this turn of events. I didn't expect it either. You shouldn't be fighting with each other over the situation you find yourselves in. We should try to figure out how we can handle this so you both don't go to jail. I take it you both want to turn down his offer of 8 to 12 years? Both of his clients rushed to flatly refuse the proposed deal. Both believed they would never be convicted of anything at trial. When it was decided that he would refuse the offer on their behalf, Basil Smith let them both go, saying that he would have a lot of work to do in preparation for trial when both clients had left. Basil was left alone in the room, and after quickly reviewing the new reports, he sat back wondering if either of his clients were telling the truth. Technically, it didn't matter. He would protect them regardless of the state of their souls. He just liked it better when he was sure his clients were telling him the truth. Several months passed, and the trial of Lisa Evans and Blake Moore was about to begin at 10 a.m. on Monday morning, with everyone in the courtroom standing, 
Judge Robert Cox took his seat. The defense table was arranged so that Basil Smith sat between two of his clients. He decided that was the best way to deal with the fact that they could hardly be polite to each other. He'd already considered suggesting that they each hire their own lawyer. It would be more of a reminder than anything else to keep them apart, but realized that they probably couldn't afford to pay for a lawyer individually. He knew that Blake Moore's business had fallen on hard times, and that Lisa Evans had recently quit her job because of the stress of the upcoming trial and the difficulties she was having communicating with her missing husband's friends and acquaintances. District Attorney Jeff Baghdadi's opening statement was the first major point, and he got right to the point. Members of the jury, I'm going to be frank with you. We do not have the body of the victim in this case, Mark Evans. However, we intend to prove to you that he is dead and that the two defendants are without a doubt guilty of his murder. He began slowly, revealing that a few months before the murder, the two defendants had begun an affair. At some point, Mark Evans became aware of this and filed for divorce from his unfaithful wife. Some points remained unknown, such as how and when exactly Mark Evans began to suspect something. He said that a trace found on Mark Evans's computer proves that he knew when and where the two adulterers were meeting. There were emails that documented his success in tracking the two defendants, organizing his finances in anticipation of divorce, and finally, a message showing his intention to meet with the two defendants. He continued, We cannot pinpoint exactly when the three members of this triangle physically came together, but we do know what the results were and we can show you through photographs and investigation reports exactly what happened. We believe that there was an encounter between the three of them, most likely at Mr. Moore's residence. And during that encounter, Mr. Evans was incapacitated. He seated in the passenger seat and probably unconscious, was then driven to a remote area of George Washington Park, located less than one half mile from Mr. Moore's home. Once in the park, one of the two defendants shot Mr. Evans in the right upper chest. We do not know if Mr. Evans was conscious at the time of the shot, but he was still sitting in the passenger seat. The evidence shows that he was dragged from the seat and thrown to the ground, hitting one of several pieces of firewood scattered around the picnic area. He was shot again as he lay on the ground. The evidence will show that this bullet grazed his carotid artery, and you'll see graphic photographs of blood indicative of the last moments of his life. At this point, Lisa Evans lost her composure, and it was only after several warnings from Judge Cox that her attorney finally managed to get her client under control so that the district attorney could continue her opening statement. The circumstances are dire, as evidenced even by the defendant's reaction. He paused for empty effect before continuing after Mr. Evans was shot a second time. He was wrapped in a plastic shroud, dragged from the picnic site, and unceremoniously loaded into the trunk of Mr. Moore's car. He was driven to a location unknown to us and buried. Mr. Moore took the murder weapon, as well as the shovels used to make Mr. Evans his grave, and dumped them in the river. We were fortunate that a concerned citizen saw this happen and reported it through Crime Stoppers. Police were able to locate the murder weapon and the tools used to kill Mr. Evans. Through expert investigative techniques and accurate forensic analysis, it was possible to prove that both defendants were at the scene of the crime. The blood of the deceased was found on the exterior of Mr. Moore's car, transferred as the unfortunate Mr. Evans was being loaded into the trunk. Lisa Evans may also be implicated in the crime. Her husband's blood was found in her car and on the shoes she wore that day. The defense will argue that the two adulterers were nowhere near the scene of this horrific crime. How will they be able to prove that? By their own testimony, of course. Each of them will claim that the other was with them at the time of the murder and therefore could not have been involved. I am sure that this self-serving testimony will not distract you, the jury, from finding them guilty. Basil Smith found it difficult to object to the statement he tried, emphasizing that the defendants were innocent until proven guilty, and that there could be no such evidence in such a circumstantial case. He asked the jury to disregard the prosecutor's opening statement and to rely on the evidence they would be shown at trial. It was a bold attempt, but several experienced court reporters from local newspapers yielded to the district attorney. 
The first witness was the department's computer expert, who testified that he had discovered emails and maps illustrating the route taken by Mrs. Evans when she met with Mr. Moore for illegal purposes. The method Mark Evans used was described in one of his letters to counsel, and the computer expert explained to the jury how a small electronic device was able to accurately track the defendant's car and then allow her husband to recreate on his computer an accurate map with times and places that told him exactly where and when she met her lover. One reporter took careful notes and planned to include the name Rocky Mountain Tracking in his article. He was sure that more than one husband or wife would review the company's product, based on Mr. Evans, his successful use of it. During his testimony, Blakemore seemed slightly bored, and Lisa Evans looked very embarrassed and did not look at the jury. Basil Smith could get nothing out of his cross-examination of this witness. The tracking device was what it was, and the emails he knew could have been quickly checked by his own legal partner, Robert Graham, interrupted for an extended lunch. The trial resumed in the afternoon, with testimony from the 911 operator and the two patrolmen who had responded to the first call. They were simply getting the basic facts surrounding the discovery of Mark Evans' car, and the testimony was relatively devoid of drama. That all changed when the detectives who arrived on the scene after the patrol officers reported the condition of the scene began their testimony. The district attorney's description of the scene was now corroborated by the medical examiners and the medical examiners on the scene. Their descriptions were clinical and accurate, illustrated by large photographs showing bullet holes, blood, and drag marks leading to the paved road. The medical examiner described the amount of blood that he believed was distributed throughout the scene. There was no way to physically measure its volume because it had been absorbed into the sand and upholstery but he estimated that it amounted to three to four pints, a good percentage of the approximately ten pints contained in the human body. His most effective testimony, however, concerned four separate streams of blood that stretched from the area of the bullet hole in the blood-soaked block of firewood. He testified that they indicated that a major artery had been severed, and the force generated by the victim's heart was pushing the blood jet away from the body. He testified that the length of each of the four separate jets was decreasing, indicating that the heart was losing its ability to pump blood. It was when he said that this proved that the victim was in the process of dying that Lisa Evans lost control of her emotions again. She screamed, No! Mark can't be dead! Lisa burst into uncontrollable tears, and when it became apparent that she would not be able to control her emotions for some time, the judge adjourned the trial. The trial was adjourned until 10 a.m. the next morning. The second day of the trial began in the same manner as the first, at 10 a.m. The medical expert took the witness stand again, but little additional information was provided. He talked mainly about the tests that had been done on the blood samples that had been taken after 15 minutes. The prosecutor, District Attorney Jeff Bragdon, ended the questioning, and the witness was turned over to the defense attorney, rising from his seat and taking a few steps toward the witness. Defense attorney Basil Smith quickly looked around to make sure his client, Lisa Evans, was in control of her emotions and was not going to disturb the court again, as she had the day before. He knew she had been prescribed something sedative, but he was still afraid she might interfere with his cross-examination of the witness. He was pleased to note that so far she seemed to be sitting quietly in her seat, he knew he would have to refute some of the medical examiner's testimony from the day before, as it was very graphic and gave the strong impression that the shooting in the park had been completely callous. Almost an execution, he began. You stated that Mark Evans lost between three and four pints of blood in the park. At the same time, you stated that it was impossible to say exactly because of the conditions and that this was simply your estimate. Isn't it possible that the blood loss could have been between one and two pints, depending on how the blood was distributed around the site? The medical examiner, known as a conscientious professional, thought for a few moments before saying it's unlikely, but not impossible. Basil Smith was silent for almost a minute, giving the jury a chance to realize the medical examiner's admission. Then he continued, what you described as Mark Evans's fatal injury could have been less fatal if someone had administered first aid immediately. 
Do you agree? Again, the medical examiner thought for a moment before answering. My answer is the same as your last question. It is unlikely, but not impossible. Medical attention would likely have been required within minutes of a wound of this nature. There is no evidence that this happened. The defense attorney quickly said there is no evidence that assistance was offered. But as you say, it is possible. He dismissed the witness, satisfied that he had secured a couple of small concessions from him. The next witness was one of the forensic scientists who specialized in guns and ammunition. He testified about the recovery of two bullets, one from a seat and one from a deck of firewood. He testified that the ammunition was of a type known as full metal jacket and that it is often used for target shooting and is a standard for the military. The bullet recovered from the car struck a metal seat support and was badly deformed, but the second bullet recovered from the firewood was in very good condition. Matching it to the weapon recovered from the river was very easy. Basil Smith had done his homework on ballistics and the science of how bullets react to human bodies. He asked, were the bullets checked for any remnants of bone or flesh through which they passed before extraction? He knew that such a test could even determine which body organs the bullet had hit. The technician confirmed that such tests had been done and continued. We found almost nothing on the bullets except traces of blood. The bullet fired into the car seat went through about two inches of various layers of padding and fabric. We think that may have cleaned it up. It's a similar situation with the second bullet that got lodged in the firewood. The bullets themselves were typically used by the military and had a GMC's or gilding metal copper steel jacket around the bullet core. It's a copper alloy with a small amount of steel added to it. He went on to explain that this jacket is much stronger than a standard all-metal jacket, which is usually made up of copper. This testimony was both good and bad for the defense. He conceded that there was no evidence that the bullets actually passed through the body, but the circumstances and style of bullet that was used tended to explain the situation. The hope that the gun could be traced was also doomed. The gun was checked against state and national registries, and all that could be found was that it had been sold at a gun show 20 years ago. No record of the buyer was kept. The only thing Basil Smith was able to get was confirmation that no fingerprints or DNA from the defendants were found on either the gun or the casings. It turned out that anything that hadn't been washed away by river water had been wiped off before the gun was disposed of. It was a small admission, but it still felt good to him. Another technician talked about checking the two shovels that had been found. There were no fingerprints or DNA evidence but both shovels were branded Moore's Landscaping. He also testified that pursuant to the authority granted by the search warrant, he inspected Moore's Landscaping premises and found 14 other shovels with identical branding. Cross-examination of this witness was of no avail. The parade of witnesses from the Forensic Science Department and detectives from the Police Department continued all morning and into the afternoon. The only serious cross-examination of Basil Smith occurred when one of the technicians described the recovery of blood samples from Blake Moore's car. The technician testified that he found blood dripped behind the license plate, as well as a smear he found on the foam trunk seal. The question quickly arose, could these smears and drops have been planted by a third party? The technician was forced to admit that it could have been, and Basil Smith returned to the defense table with a smile on his face. Things got a little more complicated when the testimony of the last technician who had been at Lisa Evans' home was brought in. Blood was found in the interior of her car, and later, more blood was found on the sole of her right shoe. Assuming the blood was planted was more difficult, however, he got the technician to admit that there was no way to determine whether the blood had been transferred from the shoe to the gas pedal, or vice versa. The lawyer hoped that the slight doubt caused by this apparent statement would allow the jury to disregard this evidence against Lisa Evans. As the continuous parade of prosecution witnesses gradually waned, the conclusion of the last of the witnesses' testimony coincided with the end of the afternoon session of the trial. As a result, the third morning began with the defense getting a chance to present its evidence. The local newspapers that evening continued to print their usual articles about past trials involving adulterers and stories based on court gossip. There were a couple of serious articles about the trial, 
which suggested that the authors felt that the defense would have great difficulty in countering the totality of the evidence presented by the prosecution. They also suggested that since there was no body, a conviction would be difficult, especially given the defense's alleged strategy of casting doubt on whether Mark Evans was really dead. Judging from several instances of cross-examination of prosecution witnesses by defense counsel, it was obvious that this was Basil Smith's goal. As the first defense witness, defense attorney Smith called a recognized expert in blood analysis. His name was Dr. Wilbur, and he had been hired to give expert testimony at many trials. He was quickly asked, What do you think of the testimony of the medical examiner who talked about the blood evidence in this case? Dr. Wilbur put on his glasses and turned to a small notebook he was holding. I believe that a much better job could have been done in collecting the blood evidence, if the blood-soaked soil samples had been properly analyzed. A much more accurate estimate of the total amount of blood at the scene could have been made, the lawyer continued. Based on your examination of the evidence collected, do you have an opinion as to the actual amount of blood at the scene? I believe it is quite possible that as little as one and a half pints of blood could have created the scene that was recorded. The final question is, do you think a person who lost as much blood as depicted in the photographs could still be alive? Dr. Wilbur responded with a one-word answer, yes. The district attorney did not cross-examine him after Dr. Wilbur was removed. Basil Smith turned to the testimony of Blake Moore. Blake calmly and bluntly stated that he was innocent of the murder of Mark Evans and personally believed that it was Mark himself who orchestrated his murder. He also stated that he had never owned a gun and that the shovels found in the river could well have been stolen from one of his company's work sites. Basil Smith wanted to keep the testimony simple and quickly turned his first witness over to the prosecutor for cross-examination. Jeff, Baghdad's first question was, what makes you think Mark Evans was a man who had organized his own murder? Blake Moore immediately told the story of Mark's reaction in high school when Blake started dating his girlfriend behind Mark's back. He recounted how Mark had threatened to destroy him. The prosecutor pondered this for a few minutes and then asked, So, Mr. Moore, this is not the first time you have chosen to engage in an illicit affair with a woman that Mark Evans expected to be protected from the interference of his best friend. Don't you think that if he wanted to destroy someone, he would have chosen you? Blake Moore couldn't answer that question directly, only muttering that he had a physical advantage over Mark and that it would have prevented his former friend from taking him on directly. So you think you could physically intimidate your best friend into taking his life by proxy? Is that what made you feel comfortable taking his wife? Is that what your actions are to your alleged best friend? You don't need to answer the question, sir. I think we can all see that your actions and assumptions are those of a narcissistic ladies' man who thinks every woman is his, and to heck with friendship. Basile quickly objected on the grounds that the district attorney was himself testifying, not just asking questions. The judge agreed and asked the jury to disregard the prosecutor's last statement. However, even this remark failed to rebut the correctness of the district attorney's statement. Blake was visibly upset at the way he had been treated by the prosecutor, but left the stand without saying anything more. Basil Smith realized that his witness's testimony had not worked as planned, but hoped that the testimony of Mark Evans, his wife, would turn the tide against them. Blake's testimony and the prosecutor's unanswered questions made Blake look bad in front of the jury. One could only hope it didn't affect their opinion of Lisa. This morning, Lisa Evans seemed to have her emotions well under control when she appeared in court. The lawyer had asked her virtually the same questions as Blake had asked her. She emphatically stated that she was not involved in any attack on her husband. She stated categorically that she loved her husband and would never participate in any attempt to physically hurt him. When asked for a version of what might have happened to him, she suggested that he might have been carjacked. Again, Basil Smith chose not to ask additional questions of his witness. When the prosecutor began to ask Lisa questions, he began by saying, Can you tell me where you were between midnight Saturday, when your husband sent his last email, and 2 p.m. Sunday afternoon? Lisa was embarrassed by such a question and replied, I told Mr. Smith where I was. I was with Blake Moore at his house from 8 o'clock Saturday night until about half past 1 p.m. Sunday afternoon. 
You didn't quite answer the question, did you? I'd like you to tell us what you did from midnight on Saturday until you got home on Sunday. Lisa was excited and confused. Finally, she said, Well, I was in Blake's bedroom at midnight and we, you know, we're doing it. She was forced to finish the sentence because the prosecutor kept suggesting she continue at every hesitation. How long did it, shall we say? Go on. He froze, waiting for her answer. We, we eventually went to bed at one o'clock. It was probably a little after one o'clock. Lisa was again very embarrassed as she answered. So from midnight to one o'clock you were doing this, and then you went to bed? Then what? Please continue the chronology. Well, we slept until about a 5.45, I think. I remember getting up to go to the bathroom. The district attorney asked, Was Mr. Moore there in bed when you woke up? Please continue. Yes, he was there. We got busy again and went to bed around 6.30 and then got up around 11 a.m. Her answer started slowly, but as she spoke, the words came out faster as she was obviously anxious to finish her statement. So when you came back from the bathroom, Mr. Moore started doing it with you, and that lasted until about 6.30 a.m., after which you both went back to bed. Is that correct? Is that how it happened? Lisa was very embarrassed and replied, No, it wasn't exactly like that. He didn't wake up when I went back to bed. I woke him up. The DA was clearly surprised by her answer, but quickly came to his senses and asked, You woke him up? What did you do? shaken by the shoulder until he woke up so you could offer to take him up on it. Lisa looked embarrassed and replied, No, I, I mean, he was already ready. She seemed to be struggling to squeeze the words out of herself as she gave this answer. The district attorney realized that he was succeeding and finding common ground with the jury, as the four female jurors clearly seemed offended by her answers. He decided to continue this line of questioning. Tell us how you woke him up whether you shook him by the shoulder. Lisa seemed resigned to having to keep answering, especially after Judge Cox overruled her attorney's objections. I just started doing it with him. That's when he woke up. She was very red in the face and kept her head turned away from the jury, which was the exact opposite of what her attorney had suggested. He asked them both to make eye contact with the jury so they could see if they were sincere. Now Jeff Bragdon was ready for the coup de grace. Earlier, you told your attorney that you love your husband. Is that true? He waited for an emphatic yes from Lisa, an answer accompanied by a vigorous nod of the head. Then he continued. I'm a little confused. You tell us how much you love your husband, but you just finished describing how you spent the night. He took his life. That night you spent in his best friend's bed and acted like a woman who has no respect for her husband. How can we believe that? You could not have been involved in his destruction? He stood and waited for a few moments, but it was obvious that Lisa wasn't going to answer his last question. She cried quietly, hiding her face in her palms. Judge Cox finally put an end to her suffering by asking if there were any more questions for the defendant or follow-up questions from the defense, when everyone answered that there were none. The judge announced that the court would recess for lunch. The courtroom was nearly empty when Lisa finally pulled herself together and left the witness stand, joining her attorney and her client. The three of them went to a very somber lunch, during which the experienced attorney warned them that the case could now go either way. Privately, he was somewhat more pessimistic, as both his clients had failed on the witness stand. The afternoon court session ended quickly as Basil Smith announced that there were no more defense witnesses. Both attorneys prepared for their closing statements, and there was no surprise in either of them. The prosecutor told the jury that there were too many explanations for the innocence of both defendants. Defense counsel stressed the circumstantial nature of the case, the absence of a body, the possibility that he might be alive, and the fact that no real motive had been offered for Mark's murder. The case was submitted to the jury by four o'clock in the afternoon, and they deliberated for two hours before retiring for the night. The next morning, Lisa and Blake went to Basil Smith's office to await word that the jury had reached a verdict. While his two clients waited in one of the conference rooms, Basil Smith was attending to other business. He had warned them that it could be a long time before they heard from the courthouse. And he was right. While they had to share the conference room, 
Lisa and Blake put aside their differences and talked about the chances of acquittal. Both of them hadn't given up hope, and neither of them could accept that the jury would believe them capable of murder. Finally, at half past 3 p.m., the call came. The jury had decided their fate. Lisa's parents came into town for the trial, though they were not present at the courthouse during her testimony. She was very grateful to them for this, as it meant they did not hear her confessions at the trial. They kept in constant contact with the court throughout the day, and were informed when it became known that the jury had reached their verdict. Lisa was relieved to feel their support, sitting at the defense table next to her attorney. The announcement of the verdict happened very quickly. Lisa and Blake were found guilty of second-degree murder. Neither of them could believe it. And Lisa burst into tears again while Blake pounded his fist on the table in frustration. After only a couple minutes, they were handcuffed and taken to the custody of the deputies on duty. Lisa only had a couple minutes to talk to her parents and confess her innocence. Being normal parents, they joined her grief before the two convicted murderers were taken to their cells. They were told that they would be back in a week for sentencing. It was a very bad ending to a difficult day. The week between conviction and sentencing passed quickly. During this time, Lisa's parents visited her daily, and Blake was visited once by a cousin. His parents were dead, and he was an only child. The week passed very slowly for him, and he soon realized how slowly time drags when you are in custody. He also began to realize how bad his future looked. Lisa was still in denial about his future and refused to talk about it when his parents brought it up. Fortunately, the sentencing announcement only took a few minutes. Both received sentences ranging from 15 years to life. Basil Smith sympathized with their situation and said he would review the court records to see if an appeal was possible. After the sentencing, things moved very quickly. Within three days, both convicts were transferred from the local jail to a state prison. The women's prison to which Lisa was assigned had a good reputation, but the same could not be said for the one to which Blake was sent. It had been the site of numerous riots over the past few years. Now that the trial and sentencing was over, the local media was no longer covering the case. Recent reports by local TV stations showed scenes of prisoners being transported in a converted school bus to the state prison. They may even have been stock footage used to make the TV stories brief, recounting the fates of two convicted felons. A few days later, there were new disasters and new crimes that caught the attention of news anchors Lisa Evans and Blake Moore seemed to disappear off the face of the earth. A couple months after the verdict, Basil Smith joined. Jeff banged in for a drink after a new case brought them back together. The Evans murder case had kept Basil Smith busy from time to time, and he told Jeff, you really did pursue them. To tell you the truth, I was surprised when the convictions were handed down. I came to the conclusion that they were probably innocent, since they never once backed down from their stories. Jeff sipped his brandy before replying. Twelve of their peers didn't believe their explanations. I try not to take these cases personally, though it's almost impossible to do so when it comes to crimes that are too horrible, or children. This case wasn't the worst I've ever handled, but it wasn't one where I could generate much sympathy for the defendant either. It only works if we have a jury decision. Basil Smith thought about his tablemate's statement and said, I guess you're right, but this case still bothers me. About a year later, there was a small item in the news about a major disturbance at the men's prison. As he read the article, Basil Smith singled out one name, and it made him think about the case again. Blake Moore had been stabbed during the riot and had been transferred to the hospital for treatment of a collapsed lung. The article stated that he was in serious condition but would survive. It had been almost 18 months since the convictions of Lisa Evans and Blake Moore for the murder of Mark Evans. Enough time had passed that even Basil Smith rarely thought about the case. That had kept him busy for the first year after he had represented the defendants. He had scrutinized the transcript several times in his spare time, but could find no legal grounds for appeal. There was not a single error in the law that he could use to the advantage of the two convicted murderers. It was a relatively quiet Wednesday morning in the New York office of the Innocence Project.
The receptionist had just returned from her morning coffee break and was taking a moment to check her appearance in the small mirror when a FedEx courier came to her desk with a package. It was one of those large padded envelopes that are regularly used for inter-office delivery of information and products, that business and industry simply can't do without, and which should have been delivered as early as yesterday. The secretary signed on the electronic notepad, offered to her, and then watched as a young man dressed in a summer uniform of t-shirt and shorts walked out of the office. Only she herself could know the nature of her thoughts, but the mischievous smile on her face would have given a clue to anyone who witnessed the whole thing. In this case, the only person in the reception area was an attractive young black woman sitting behind the receptionist's desk. The package was addressed simply to the office, so she opened it to determine how the contents should be disposed of. Inside, she found a DVD, a sealed black plastic bag with a biohazard label, and a multi-page letter. Since she had no pressing business to attend to at the moment, she began reading the letter. It took several minutes, and the gamut of emotions that flashed across her face as she read the letter would have intrigued any observer of what was going on. No one else entered the office after the stout FedEx man left, so her expressive reactions again went unnoticed. When she finished reading the letter, she sat pensive for a while, then picked up the phone and pressed one of the intercom buttons, waited a few seconds, and then said, Tony, could you come out to see us for a minute? We just received a package that I think you'll be interested in. She sat and listened for almost 15 seconds before she continued. Yes, it seems to be something the team can work on. It deals with several murder convictions that apparently need to be overturned. About a minute later, a tall, red-haired young man in a white short sleeve shirt and worn jeans came out of one of the offices overlooking the reception area thanked her taking the package, and disappeared again behind the door from which he had emerged. The comfortably dressed young man was Tony Kelly, a recently graduated lawyer who felt that before he started chasing a high-paying associate position at a Wall Street law firm, he should devote some time to the public good. He'd been at the Innocence Project for almost a year, doing mostly basic legal research for the more senior lawyers who'd founded the office a few years earlier. While he knew he wasn't going to stay there for the rest of his career, he enjoyed making a difference in the lives of those who had been wrongfully convicted of serious crimes. Returning to the comfortable swivel chair behind the relatively cheap plywood desk, he placed the contents of the FedEx envelope on the bureau and picked up the letter, taking a quick glance at the DVD and sealed package. Leaning back in his chair and placing his Nike sneaker-clad feet on the corner of the desk, he began to read the letter. The letter was typed on the computer in an easy-to-read font, and he quickly immersed himself in its contents. The Innocence Project, New York, regarding the convictions for the murders of Lisa Evans and Blake Moore. I don't know where to begin, so I'll start at the beginning. That way, I can put things in order, and hopefully not forget anything important. My name is not important, but the information I have been asked to give you could make a real difference in the lives of not only the two convicted murderers named above, but also in the future well-being and happiness of five other people, one of whom is me. I will begin with the day, almost 15 months ago, when, in response to an ad I placed in the local newspaper, a man walked into me from the street. I was looking for a computer literate person to join me in my small computer services company. A short interview revealed that he knew at least as much about computers and their use in business networks as I did. I have since learned that he knows even more than I do. In any case, I hired him right away. This man, who I will refer to as Mark throughout this letter, was probably the quietest person I've met in a while. This had no effect on his ability to do his job, which he did very, very well. Within two months, my business grew by at least 50%. Due to his efforts, advice, and the long hours he seemed to insist on working. When he started working for me, he told me that he had just arrived in town and hadn't rented a place yet since my business was still in its infancy. I was thinking about renting out the basement room in our house for extra income. I wanted to be able to put the profits from my business back into it so that it would grow and eventually provide a living for me and my young son. I knew I was taking a risk when I rented the room to Mark, but something about him convinced me that he was no threat to us. 
We began a routine that continues to this day, although it has changed in its dynamics. He spent the first three months in that bedroom in the basement, though. He ate with us, and we commuted to and from work together every day. At first, he always went back to the office to work extra hours that he didn't ask to be paid for. He always told me that he would rather spend that time being productive than in front of the TV or sleeping. Over time, our relationship evolved from a boss-employee relationship to one of friendship, and eventually to what it has become now, a loving family relationship. My son calls him dad, and it is true in every way. From the very beginning, I knew something was bothering Mark a lot. Over time, his extremely quiet nature and his frequent habit of going into deep thought about things I knew nothing about led to a confrontation of sorts between us. One afternoon, when the office was very quiet, I locked the door and called him into my private office. I was determined to find out what was bothering him so much, as I began to realize how my feelings for him were developing. It took some time, but I convinced him to share what was bothering him. He finally told me that he was running from a failed marriage that had shaken him to his core. He told me that his wife had betrayed him, along with a good friend, and that he had almost committed murder and suicide because of it. We continued to talk for the rest of the day, sharing our worries about unfaithful spouses. My husband left me for another woman, and Mark left his wife because of her relationship with another man. We had common ground, and our conversations seemed to help him overcome one of the last obstacles he faced in getting over his past life. This conversation was also the catalyst that brought us together. We started seeing each other on weekends, maintaining two separate relationships employer and employee during the week, and man and woman on Saturdays. After a month of this relationship, it got to the point where it didn't make sense for him to keep his bedroom in the basement, and he moved into my bedroom with me. From then on, we became a family, although I still felt like he was hiding something from me. We continued our relationship growing as a couple. I know I love him, and I'm sure he loves me and my son. I really should say our son, because that is how he feels about him. The boy is about to turn four and needs a loving relationship with his father something his biological father has utterly failed to provide. He hasn't seen his biological father since he was too young to remember him. This was the situation we found ourselves in four days ago when Mark collapsed at work. It took three days in the ICU before they decided that his problem was heart-related and that he would need open-heart surgery to correct a condition that apparently had been with him since birth. Once his condition stabilized, he was moved to a private room. Now he was awake, and we could finally talk to each other. When I first walked into his room, I knew right away that something was wrong, and that it was seriously bothering him. It was then that he told me this story, that he was afraid he would die with him if he didn't have heart surgery. It was very important for him to finally close the door on this episode in his life. He told me this story over the course of the day, and once I agreed to print it for him, and make sure it got into your hands, it seemed like the whole weight of the world fell off his shoulders. Now he's asleep, and I'm typing it on my laptop, and my, I mean, our son is lying on the bed next to him, sleeping too. I think I will have most of the night to finish this letter. I still have to get home and create the DVD, which I will talk about later, and pick up a few other things before I can send this information to you. I really want to have the letter ready to send by noon tomorrow. The problem of sending it from some place that will not allow you to trace its return to us must also be solved. The story my husband told me, which is what he is to me, began almost two years ago. He was happily married to Lisa, and their marriage was almost in its sixth year. One night, not sure why it caught his attention, he noticed a small oval bruise on the side of her right breast. At first he thought it was just a bump that appeared when she bumped into a corner of furniture at home or in the office where she works as a part-time secretary. He said it began to bother him as he lay there, as it looked more like a love bite than a bruise, and he knew it was through no fault of his own. Thoughts of it kept him awake most of the night, as more and more scenarios of how that bruise came to be appeared in his head. Thoughts of it didn't leave him the next day when he went to work. By the time he got to his office, he decided he had done something stupid. After all, he had absolutely no evidence that anything bad had happened. He figured it was all just circumstantial evidence. 
Just before lunch, the manager of the parts delivery department stopped by his office. He had ordered a tracking device for a trial run to better coordinate the delivery service. He wanted Mark to evaluate it and make recommendations. Mark was left with the device, the software, and all instructions on how to use it. It didn't take him long to decide how he would test it. Three days after installing the device in his wife's car, he was sitting at his desk at work and decided to test the monitor program to see if it was still monitoring his wife's car. She told him she was going shopping in the afternoon, but the tracking device showed that she had left the house and headed straight for the home of Blake Moore, his best friend. An hour later, he checked again, but her car was still there, not believing something was going on. He called her cell phone when she said she was out shopping. He immediately knew something had gone drastically wrong. That evening, he casually asked her how her day had gone and had to listen to her explanation about going shopping. He told me that he felt almost physically sick, but decided he shouldn't jump to conclusions. He decided to observe her for another week while he was out of town on business. He managed to follow her car through three states when she spent time at Blake's house from 8 o'clock in the evening until 2 in the morning. When he talked to her the next day, she told him she had been home all the previous night. Apparently, the shock of confirming her infidelity was too much for him. When he returned from his trip, he contemplated destruction. He knew his friend Blake was a real ladies' man, but he never thought the latter would go after Lisa. Likewise, his wife's betrayal had nearly ripped his heart out of him. That first night back home, he visited the elderly widow next door ostensibly to retrieve a wrench from her late husband's toolbox. Mark knew that her late husband had long ago hidden the gun at the bottom of his large toolbox, apparently because his wife had forbidden him to keep guns in the house. One day, he showed it to Mark while the two of them were having a beer. Instead of taking the pipe wrench, Mark found and took the revolver from the toolbox. As he explained to me, he intended to use it to destroy Mark and Lisa and then kill himself he decided he would wait until the next time they got together. While he was in town, he would have no problem quitting his job and heading to Blake's to catch them together, and then exact his final revenge. Since he'll have to keep an eye on his wife's car for a few weeks, he's ordered one of the tracking devices for himself so he can return the one he was given for evaluation. Thankfully, Lisa and Blake didn't have to make a date for almost another week, because if they had my son and I, never would have had the great pleasure of seeing Mark in the days he had to wait for them to get together, he came up with a better plan. He decided to try and frame them for murder, and describe to me how he did it. It took a whole week to devise the plan, and another week to get everything he needed to carry it out. When everything was ready, he made an excuse to go away on a weekend business trip, pretty sure the two would meet while he was out of town. After watching his wife's car during his absence, he finally saw her leave their house and drive to Blake's. This was the signal to put his plan into action. He was creating a paper trail to make it look like he was in the process of divorcing his wife. The last item was an email to the lawyer that would point directly at Lisa and Blake. Apparently, he had almost forgotten to send it, and that could mean the whole plan would fall apart. The last thing he did before he left his house was use his neighbor's revolver to fire a bullet into the passenger seat of his car, and another into one of the wooden blocks he had assembled. The sound of the shot was muffled by an old blanket and the fact that he was in a closed garage. He told me that firing those bullets was a huge relief to him, because he knew he had finally started down the path to his revenge. You should look for archived newspaper articles which can be found online. Mark followed the trial daily online and said that most of the story about what he did was written by court reporters. When he started telling me about what he had done, it all seemed to add up to one long story. I didn't want to interrupt him, so I may forget to mention a detail here. Also, pick up a copy of the court transcript. Mark thinks that all of them together should clear things up. First, he drove his car to a park near Blake's house and found a secluded spot where he could work on preparing his death. A large gym bag was full of everything he had accumulated for his plan, and he spread it all out on a picnic table, which he covered with an old blanket. The first thing he unloaded was the pieces of firewood, plastic sheeting, and the spare tire. Using the plastic on which he stacked the firewood and spare tire, 
he created an obvious drag trail that led to the paved road. The tire was then returned to the trunk. The firewood was spread around the picnic area, and the plastic was removed. He used a small maglite flashlight to do all this, and when he was done, he sat down quietly at the table to see if anyone would show up. Seeing the flashes of light that occurred while he was setting everything up, sitting down, he inserted a large needle into his left hand to draw blood. He was able to buy everything he needed at a medical supply store, saying he was taking care of his elderly mother. The blood was collected in a homemade plastic bag, and the only thing he feared was that the blood would clot too much before he could dilute it with distilled water and pour it where it needed to go. It took him over an hour to collect almost two pints of his own blood, most of which he diluted with a pint of distilled water. The first thing he did with all the blood was fill a small plastic bottle and use it to spray the blood in a pattern that he hoped would resemble an arterial jet. Most of the remaining blood, mixed with water, was smeared on the car seat and the ground to give the impression that someone had lost a lot of blood. Some more whole blood was used to fill the bullet hole in the firewood and the hole in the passenger seat upholstery. I hope I'm getting the details right, because I don't really feel like waking him up to read this to him. He needs his rest as he is scheduled for surgery tomorrow afternoon. I pray that there are no complications, and that he gets through the surgery, regardless of whether I have all the details correct. There remains the matter of the DVD I'm going to make for you. Mark took pictures, sort of before and after pictures on his digital camera, as he did everything there in the park. He said there were even pictures of him drawing his own blood. I haven't seen them, but he gave me a password so I could access the photo files on our server at work. They've been sitting there since he started working with me, which I never knew about his souvenirs, as he called them. Apparently the pictures turned out pretty good, although he had to take them by the light of his little flashlight. He was afraid someone would see the flash if he used it anyway. When he was done with the car and the blood in the park, he packed everything in his gym bag and walked out of the park. There was an old car on a side street that he had bought for the purpose, and he told me how he almost got to it, despite drinking lots of fluids and taking supplements. When he got to the car, he was very dizzy from blood loss. He rested in the car until almost six in the morning, but knew he still had to drive to Blake's house to finish the job he had started. Lisa's car was still there, which he had in no way expected, and it was unlocked. He figured that was a real bonus for him, as he managed to squeeze a couple drops of blood onto the gas pedal as he moved from Lisa's car to Blake's car. He realized that there was a dim light on in Blake's bedroom, and he was very scared that one of them had seen him. As soon as he smeared blood on Blake's car, he hurriedly drove away from there. From Blake's house, he went to the payphone on the opposite side of the park, just after sunrise. He used the payphone to call 911 to report his car in the park. He installed a professional model voice changer phone device purchased from a spy store in Pittsburgh, and used it so that they would mistake him for a woman. It worked pretty well, as it allowed him to change timber tone and pitch. He then went to a dock on the river, where he lowered two Blake shovels and a revolver into the water. When he had done all this, he told me that he felt very exhausted. He thinks that up to this point, he had been feeling a rush of energy from the realization that nothing had gone wrong in his plan. There was a small motel about a mile away where he had already rented a room, and he went there to keep a low profile and rest. He spent two days there taking supplements and eating energy bars. I'm a little confused about the timeline, but at some point he came out with his voice changer and made another call, this time as an old man. That call helped the police find the revolver he had discarded. That's probably all he told me. I will read it to him in the morning and correct any mistakes. I really hope that when he sees that I have everything ready to print, he will be much calmer. The whole reason he told me the story and insisted that I send it to you is that he wants to break the last thread, holding him back from his former life as Mark Evans sometime before he got here. He acquired the identity he uses now and by which my son and I know him, he wants to keep that identity and never be Mark Evans again. Please do everything you can to overturn the convictions of Lisa Evans and Blake Moore. Tomorrow, I'll pick up a copy of the New York Times and an inkwell. We'll use a piece of the front page to put all of Mark's fingerprints so they're clearly visible. Then we'll prick his finger and make a big blood stain on the paper. 
When it's compared to the DNA from the park, it will be proof that he's alive. All of this should be enough to get them out of jail. That was the end of the computer printed letter, but an additional handwritten message at the bottom read, Mark came out of surgery and very good condition. He wants me to fly to Seattle tomorrow and send this package. I hate to leave him, but I know he will feel much better after sending it. I told you before that this will affect five of us, but I see I never explained what I meant. Mark and I are expecting twins in about three months. Tony Kelly turned the last page to see if anything had been added to the back, but it was blank. He swung his feet off the corner of the desk and turned to look at the other items that were in the package. The DVD was labeled Photos, taken in George Washington Park, on the back of the black plastic envelope with scrawled fingerprints and DNA. He took another look at the printed pages, checking for additional handwriting on the back of each, and then called one of the senior attorneys. This was not something he could handle alone. It took only a short time to confirm that the DNA did indeed belong to Mark Evans, and the fingerprints confirmed that he was still alive when they were compared to those taken from his car found in the park. Faced with irrefutable proof that two men had been convicted of a murder that never happened, the state attorney general and governor expedited their release. A week later, they were back in the courtroom where they were convicted along with Basil Smith, Lisa's parents, and even District Attorney Jeff Blagden with some state representatives. The state attorney general apologized to the court system and the state for their botched conviction. He also stated that there is no doubt that the blame for this whole unfortunate case lies with Mark Evans. The judicial system had worked, but it had been diverted from justice by the concerted efforts of one determined man. He then announced that their department would make every possible effort to find Mark Evans and hold him accountable for the considerable amount of money he had caused the city and state to spend. The cost of police, forensics, litigation, and jail time will be tallied, and he intends to seek reimbursement. Charges will also be filed. However, when asked by a reporter if they had any idea where to start looking for Mark Evans, he only shook his head. Blakemore seemed to have changed for the better. The cocky and arrogant man had been replaced by someone who seemed much more inclined to compromise. He apologized to Lisa for instigating the chain of events that had resulted in them spending almost a year and a half in jail. Lisa didn't seem to care at all. It seemed that she had become completely despondent and longed only for one thing to leave the courthouse with her parents before the two of them left. Both Basil Smith and the district attorney apologized for what had happened. Both attorneys felt they had been badly misled by the machinations of Mark Evans. It seemed to both of them that they should have been smarter than to be duped by a vindictive husband. Later, they both thought they would have to pay much more attention to the details of future cases. Although the state attorney found that the state was not liable, Lisa and Blake received a payment of $50,000, waiving their right to further legal action or compensation. Shortly after receiving the check, Blakemore left town. His business went bankrupt, and his house was sold to pay his legal fees. There was nothing else holding him back. The only thing he said to Lisa after they were handed the checks was Mark really screwed us over, didn't he? This check is only a fraction of what my house and business would be worth if he hadn't found out about us. I hate to say I told you so, but I knew he was setting us up. Lisa was still only a shadow of her old self. She had lost the house she and Mark owned to non-payment and foreclosure. She had also lost weight in prison, but had acquired what could be called wrinkles of worry that weren't there before. She looked hopelessly lost and accepted the check as if it were just a piece of paper, slipping it into her purse. She said, I think we deserve it, Blake. I don't even care about the time I spent in jail. It only cost me 18 months of my life, but I lost Mark forever. She left with her parents without even saying goodbye. Two weeks after cable news ran a story about Lisa and Blake's release, a large envelope arrived at attorney Basil Smith's office with a courier. Inside was a short note to the attorney and a sealed envelope addressed to Lisa Evans. He made an appointment to give her the letter on his way home at exactly five o'clock that evening. The lawyer knocked on Lisa's apartment after a short and polite conversation. He left her standing at the door, looking at the envelope with apprehension and a little hope. Finally taking the envelope to the kitchen and looking at it for a few more long seconds, she opened it. 
the familiar handwriting on the envelope told her that it was a letter from Mark, and she realized that she simply had to read what it said. Lisa, I would like to apologize for letting you spend so long in jail. I've never been vindictive, but having you and Blake betray me has practically driven me crazy. My new life and the happiness I found has finally made me realize that until I freed you both, I was a prisoner, just like you. I know the authorities will be looking for me for some time to come, but I'm confident that I am safe in my new life with my new family. Good luck to you, and goodbye. Mm, the short letter slipped from her hand and flew to the floor, taking with it the last faint hope of reconciliation with Mark.